Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome for this afternoon. I think we will have uh, a grand opportunity to uh, go into our minds in a very wonderful, deep way and hopefully demystify spirituality, simplify spirituality, and make things more obvious and more simple, which is really a good prayer of the heart. We're always asking God or Spirit, just show me, reveal it to me, make it obvious. Help me have an experience. And I'd just like to welcome everyone and start off by saying I was doing a, a Skype call this morning and, and what came through was in a world of concepts, we have a whole cosmos of concepts that forgiveness is a concept as well. And uh, we, most of us have learned that concept somewhere along the way. And um, I would say we have to kind of clear our mind of all of our false ideas of forgiveness and come to a true experience of what it means and what it feels like. Welcome. Hi, Hi No problem. I think we'll have people filtering in, so we make the chairs. Yeah. So, um, I would say, in my experience and in our experience, forgiveness is a very uh, helpful and useful and functional concept. Uh, but, you have to embrace it completely for it to be effective, to, to the extent that we make exceptions or we try to mix it with other things of the world. I want forgiveness and peace, but I want this instead. I want my girlfriend or boyfriend to call me or I want <laughs> I want this uh, form to look a certain way in my life, or appearance to be something, then we interfere with forgiveness. And really, forgiveness is what is the purpose underneath all of these images in time and space, kind of covered over by all of these images, and not so much by the images themselves, but by making the images important, by turning the images into idols or something that we value more than peace of mind, more than happiness, then it obscures us from the experience of peace. So, Francis and I have come, we flew up from Spain. We brought a little bit of the Spain weather up here <laughs> to England for these last couple days. We've been sweating a little bit. <laughs> Very nice, lots of sunshine. And uh, it's beautiful that we had this this uh, cozy atmosphere and cozy opportunity to, to go into some of these deep experiences that, that are so precious and yet sometimes so covered over in awareness to look at those. We thought of a theme too for today of trust, really going into trust in a deep way. What is trust and, and ways to experience trust and some experiences from our lives. So, you want to share a little bit too? Introduce. Sure. Yeah, I think this, you know, when we talk about trust, this, this life that we live, we seem to live, is a work of trust. You know, we make decisions on a daily basis, and it is who we're making decisions with in, from a moment to moment basis. And um, just before this trip, we were, we had a very brief trip in Ireland. It was quite a spontaneous trip in Ireland. And then we have a few days before we come over here. And we have an invitation to Portugal. And I thought, I, I was really inspired to, to rest. So if we go to Portugal in between, then that means another return flight and the immediate turnaround after Ireland and the immediate turnaround to come here. It's like there's no, no gap in between, no rest, but it turned out to be the most restful trip for us, just to, by following the spirit, you know, the rest is actually in the mind. 
and the body doesn't really feel exhaustion or anything. But that, you know, in, in itself is just consistently the spirit wants to convince us through, you know, everyday life that you can trust, you can trust me, you don't have to bring the past judgment of what's going to bring you exhaust, exhaustion or tiredness, what is what, what is the best for you, because when the mind is so confused of who it is, it doesn't know what is the best. It doesn't really know what anything is for. So, you know, all that we can devote our life, our time, our energy to is actually to be reminded by the Spirit, step by step, to remember who we are. And it is through following, following Him. Because I heard yesterday, actually, in the recording, that Jesus said He is the way. You know, when He says He is the way, the Christ mind is the way, is the way back. What, what does that mean, the Christ mind is the way? It's in the decision making, in the choosing of the mind that we think with. That is the way back home. So it is really like a life that we live. When we give over our decision making, to the Christ mind, you know, seemingly we're still living our life playing with form symbols and we're doing different things, but the experience is completely different. The experience is completely different because the experience is the experience of open up because you choose not to protect or plan or defend a self that doesn't exist. You started to give over the mind to the Christ mind to open up. Open up to see the connectedness of everything. So it's quite a miraculous life when we started to commit in this way. And I've been thinking a lot, like we talk in our recent talks, we, we talked quite a bit about commitment, you know, commitment to the spirit it's either 100% or not at all. Because we are either committing to give our mind to the spirit or to the ego. It's very, very, you know, it's one or the other. So, yeah, just even just the recent trips that Davey and I, we were, we, I came here to Europe actually since May. As I came here in May and we, um, we started up a new center in Spain. And David came end of July and we started to, to travel um, in Europe. But just the flow, when we tapped into this flow, the miracles is just so beautiful, you know. We went to Ireland and um, I completely it didn't even come to my mind to check in ahead of time. So we arrived at the airport, and normally, you know, you don't check in, there's a long queue of people waiting for checking in. So when we arrived there at the airport, I realized, okay, I forgot to check, check us in. I didn't receive any prompt to, it just slipped my mind. And then there was empty, no nobody, no queue, and a few staff waiting to see who is coming to check in. So when we were, when we arrived, when we were approaching the, the desk, they were fighting, come to my, come to my desk, come, no, come to my desk. So we like, okay, we, we go to separate desks. And we went to the separate desk and they were like, okay, let's see who is faster. It was so playful. The whole scene was like, let's see who is faster. And free um, checking that luggage if you need. We, we were like, no, we don't need, we, have very, very small carry-ons. And then they put us in this front row, because normally when I check in, I, I select a seat for David to have like more leg room. I forgot, and then they gave us this row number one, which was really, really spacious. Then on the way back, I remember to check in, and then I realized the first row is that you have to pay 
to do to sit in in that row. So it's like, you know, when we live in this world, the the the, the forms seem to reflect back all these miracles, but the miracles are not really the form. It's actually the state, this attitude that when we just flow with the spirit and true spirit, moment to moment, it's just very very wonderful. So I get, I guess, just it is our inspiration to live in this way and to share how easy and how beautiful this pathway is. Because you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about this pathway being radical or difficult. I think no, actually, when we sit with our normal way of looking at this world. From the ego perspective, it's very, very hard. It's a very hard way of living, because we sit with something that we know deep down is not real, is not true, and we choose not to look at them directly. So that you know is actually a very hard way of living. That's in my experience. So yeah, it just feels. Very grateful to actually be able to come here and share our joy and share our experience with you all. And I want to say that please feel free to raise questions and interrupt us whenever you feel, because we just want to make it very interactive and we want to share our examples and our life experiences. So do not hesitate to to raise your hand, raise your hands. High pitched noise. I want it to be practical too. Is everybody here okay? Because we do have、uh, sweet cars and it's hot, so we open the windows. But we probably can turn the sound system up if it would help. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whether. I was just asking about the sound. Does everybody? Yes.、Uh, I would. I would like a little bit louder. Okay. Very good. That's. Can we do that? Um, I actually don't know whether we can because it's locked in that room. Oh, it's, up, it's upstairs. Okay. But I can close the the door. Maybe. Yeah, we've got some of the windows open there, but maybe we can close the the door to the very front. Oh, I mean, let me check the speakers. Yes. Yeah. Would it be more helpful if you sat here? That's true. I just saw the woman who's helping us walk by too, so she may be able to turn turn the sound up. It's up to up there. We're just discovering all these things, so we will do our best to get the sound turned up just a little bit more loud. That and well, I'm sure we'll get something going with this thing too. Yeah, it looks like. She have a key. Do you want to speak? She's she's going to do it for us. So she will. Very good. So, for me, when we talk about God or spirit or any of these terms, source and so forth. I really believe that that authentic spirituality has to be extremely practical to be effective. So I think the reason, even over here in Europe, that that per, that God or spirituality and everything can sometimes get a bad a bad name because of centuries of misuse of some of these words: God, spirit. So on and so forth. If if you take something、uh, and you misuse it, then people will close down. They'll shut down. They, their ears almost close. I've heard different people who talk about evolution. They say eventually human beings will develop ear flaps. So instead of just、uh, not listening, that flap will come right over. <laughs> and it'll be pretty obvious. Oh, you really don't want to hear what I'm saying. 
trying to flap his arm. <laughs> it, that would be very obvious. You don't have to pretend to be polite. Uh, when the flaps come on, then that means no. But, but this, the ego, we could say, or the error of, of this world, has, has guarded against the discovery of love. And so even though we may sing along when the Beatles sing, all you need is love. And I found that in lots of different uh, countries I go to. They, they know the lyrics, all you need is love, in any language. They, they can sing it in English. Welcome. Hi, Hi there. Come on in. Uh, we're here to be extremely straightforward and practical. And so if we start to discuss some ideas, and we say the ideas, but it doesn't, you don't relate to it in a strong way or whatever, then that's what Francis was saying, feel free to say, wait, stop right there, can you give me an example? Or a couple examples of that, or can you show me a metaphor, or something that will help with the clarity of that? Because we don't want to keep spirituality in the realm of ideas and theory and theology, which is what a lot of religion is, there's a lot of theology. But uh, we want to bring it right down into the here and now, into a practical experience of connection. To me that's what spirituality is about, it's a feeling, it's an experience of connection. And that's what we're going for, is to go into that experience together, of that connection. Not some kind of theological agreement. Um, I just saw a nice clip on YouTube of, of a man named Art Linkletter interviewing children. He interviewed children from the 1950s on, onward to the 1970s and 80s. And he would ask them questions about God. They'd talk about Adam and Eve and, and a lot of things that they were taught from the Bible. But the children uh, came up with very funny answers because even the children realized at some level that they have to understand something or it has to be practical. And if they don't understand it, then they just will make up something that is a little more understandable. They, they asked one girl, uh, where did um, Adam and Eve come from? And, and, uh, and so the little girl said, well, Eve came from a rare rib. And uh, Art Linkler said, what, 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 you, what was that first word? He said, rare. <laughs> she said, a rare rib. <laughs> they come up with the funniest things because in her own mind, you know, it's got to be some kind of important thing. Not just from a rib, from a rare rib, she says. And it went on and on. And, and uh, that Adam disobeyed God, and Eve disobeyed God, and so God punished the little boy, said, God punished Adam and Eve. And so our link letter said, how? Well, he said, well, he made Adam read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that was the punishment. He made Adam read the Bible. And then the boy said, and... Oh, and he made him write the Bible, <laughs> which is a long book. And so our maker said, what about Eve? How did he punish Eve? He made her into a housewife. <laughs> you see, the children will fill in the story to make it meaningful in some way that they can comprehend it. And that's kind of what happens with human beings. We, we use concepts, we use ways to kind of use concepts to try to figure out and understand things, even though these concepts may have nothing to do with the truth. Feel free to use any paradigm that you like. If you want to use science, then let's use science to talk about this today. We don't have to be limited to religion or limited to philosophy. Uh, science is a great way also to approach this experience. We know we have Isaac Newton, the scientific method, and the empirical way of deducing and learning from the world. And then we have quantum physics, which is basically saying that 
Uh, consciousness is the ground of all being, that, that we have a connectedness that they call the quantum field, which is just another way of talking about forgiveness, that unified awareness that Jesus and a lot of prophets and saints have talked about. So we, we aren't really limited at all by semantics even. We can, we can use whatever. We can use poetry. We can use Rumi. We can use some of the transcendentalist poets. There, there are many ways. We, we won't let language stop us from coming into an experience. In fact, we might even say that in our joining this afternoon, there's, there's nothing that's off limits. So you can use anything that you want. <laughs> art metaphors, nature metaphors, it just goes on and on. And yet, we, we aren't here to just use the words, we're here to have an experience of our connectedness. That's really what it's all about. There are pathways to God that, that don't use words. It's very traditional. Meditation is an example of one where you just sink deep inward beneath the thoughts, beneath the words, and come into a direct experience of source, or spirit, or that connectedness that we know. Uh, we're here in Forest Row, and we've learned from our host that Forest Row is, is kind of known for being very open-minded, and that's very symbolic too, that we're having our gathering. Uh, we have a place in the United States that's kind of known for that. It's called Berkeley, out in uh, California. Open-minded, free thinking, open discussions, everything is welcome. A trust that there's a, an experience underneath the words that we can all drop into, where we're totally connected. There's no separation at all. And for us, it's we just enjoy the experience of it. It's Sometimes it's like being in a feather that's on the wind and just enjoying the ride. Wherever the wind blows the feather, like in Forrest Gump. Some of you might remember Forrest Gump, the opening scene is the camera following a feather. I think that's one of the most spectacular openings to the movie because it sets the tone of the whole movie. That's, that's Forrest. You know, he's, he goes with the flow, he's clueless. Feather is not trying to direct the, the wind. The feather is not trying to direct the direction of the wind, it's just being carried by it. And that's the kind of thing we want to convey is, is when you get surrendered in your life, surrendered away from opinions, surrendered away from agendas, surrendered away from control, trying to control the world, control the series of events. Letting go of trying to control people. Just imagine how serene and tranquil that would be if you could just let go of, of controlling people. And I mean all people. For many people it's like, well yeah, I, I don't, I'm not trying to control the world. Well, you may apply that to most of the seven billion people, but then there's a few that are kind of close. The partner. Expectations get laid on the partner. As if, oh, I picked you. No pressure, but out of seven billion, <laughs> you're the one <laughs> that I've picked. So we're going to bring in some <laughs> expectations. <laughs> you see how subtle it is, but that's the human condition, putting expectations on the partner, on the children, on the parents, on the immediate family. You may even start to put some expectations on your neighbors. Because there's a fence, or there's a boundary. And if the neighbors start doing things that encroach upon a yard, digging, moving things around, or whatever, we're back to the War of the Roses. You know, it's, it can turn ugly very quick. So, that's why we talk about trust, because it takes great trust in a higher power, in a spirit, in an intuition, call it whatever you want to call it. It takes a higher trust in order to be like the feather that just floats with the wind in a state of ease. And the practical way that you can tell 
how connected you are to this presence or source is, is the ease by which you experience the world. If everything just seems to be in a rhythm, if everything just drops into place and falls into place easily, if you're gliding, I like that word, gliding through the world, then you know that you are connected because it, there's an E to divine eastward. Even in the movie The Matrix, some of you know The Matrix, when Neo is first giving his instruction uh, from Morpheus, they go into a, a training program where they're walking down the street. I always love to watch that scene from The Matrix because Morpheus is moving very easily. He's talking and moving. He's going against a big crowd of people and he's gliding along and Neo is getting swatted like a fly and bumped from every other person. A bump here, a bump there. And then the scene ends when Neo isn't even looking at Morpheus anymore. He's looking at the woman in the red dress. Were you listening to me or were you looking in the at the woman in the red dress, and then he freezes it. Because obviously he's looking at the woman in the red dress. That's a temptation to not be present. It's a temptation to not be in the flow, is to look at something and make something of the world important. So your attention gets drawn on the object, and away from that beautiful, you might say, subjective flow that is very, very natural. Oh, welcome, we have another guest coming, joining us. Hello! <laughs> Join us whenever you come in. And uh, so that's, that gives us something that's very practical to work with. In terms of how does this work, you might say, uh, some people use the word prayer. If you live a very prayerful life, or if you talk about it more in terms of Buddhist terms, uh, then terms, it would be mindfulness. If you're in a mindfulness attitude, or you're in a prayerful state of mind, the Christian mystic might say, that when your prayer becomes unified, if you really give yourself permission to pray for peace, to really focus on your peace of mind, and focus on your attitude and your state of mind, you say, no, I'm worth it. I'm, my peace of mind is worth it. I'm not going to get sucked into the future thoughts and the past regrets, the worry thoughts of the future, the concerns about how will I make a living, how will I survive, what will I spend my life doing. If you actually say, no, no, I'm actually more interested in being peaceful and calm and tranquil than I am about anything else, to me that's a devotion to spirit or devotion to God. You can use any name that you want. You don't even have to use religious terms. You could say, oh, I'm into focus, or I'm into concentration. <laughs> For some people, that's good. They don't want to hear about God. Concentration. Oh, tell me more how to concentrate. How to be focused. How to be in alignment. How to be congruent. You know, you can use so many words. It's, it's so beautiful. We can use any words we want. But how can I be in that alignment and flow. And ultimately too, maybe we can give you a context that the more that you give yourself over to just that simple peace and, and that peace of mind that I would say that your attention, your focus and your, your valuing of the things of this world will seem to go down. The more connected you are the more content you are. Welcome. Thank you. Hi there. And the more content you are, the less ambitious you are. I mean, if you're content, why would you have, have ambition? You know. This can be the biggest difficulty for those that go on the authentic journey because we've been programmed and conditioned to be very ambitious. We've been taught, we've been believing, we've been conditioned to be ambitious. And there have been many great teachers that have warned us about this conditioning. <laughs> uh, I believe it was Gandhi, there's, there's been others that, uh, that have said, 
that they, they have let go or renounced the idea of, of ambition. There was a, an early Course in Miracles teacher who's passed on named Tara Singh. Some of you might have heard of Tara Singh, but he was a Sikh from India who studied A Course in Miracles. And he said the statement one time, if I am ambitious, then I will be ruthless. He made the connection between ambition and ruthlessness. And for most of us, that's not too big of a stretch. We can see that ambition and greed are cousins. And greed and ruthlessness uh, are quite connected as well. And so, that's an example of how if you follow the Spirit, you will be guided away from a lot of the typical conditionings of this world. Jesus said, I'm calling you out of the world. I'm saying, we'll look at this in a practical way. Not that he's saying, I want you to go live in a cave or I want you to go off to live in isolation. But he is saying, I want to take you away from judgment and ego thinking into an inner kingdom of peace and serenity. So, once you start to realize that, that this is the direction of your calling, back home or back to the heart, then it's helpful to have this context because the ego will try to protest all along the way, like don't get too spiritual, don't get too weird, don't get too uh, crazy. But peace of mind isn't crazy or weird. It's actually natural. And when you're called into the natural, the ego will protest because the ego is unnatural. It's the idea of edging God out, to use that acronym. It's, uh, it's the idea of separation, of division. It's, it's the idea of death. Sometimes people ask me, what is the ego? It's a death wish. And it's not something you would want to invest in. Even though, that's what the whole programming of the world is, is invest in pride and separation in distinguishing yourself from the others, in superiority, in being better than others. In my experience, uh, what the world is conditioning is about, I've seen is, is actually utter nonsense. And as far as I kind of went into it, which included like 10 years of uh, university and pursuing degrees and status and recognition and all those things, I, my eyes were opened up at some point where it was like, no, that's not the direction. We have to reverse. <laughs> that all that accumulating and achieving and building and, and learning and, and all that has been in, not in a helpful direction. We have to go the other way. And with a sense of humbleness, not with a sense of griping and complaining, and, oh, I wasted 10 years in the universe. No, no, I didn't waste anything. You should be grateful for the insight that we're going in a calm, peaceful direction now, instead of over-learning the impossible. We're going to unlearn everything. So, and the other thing I think we can do in, in our practicalities today is Let's use some practical examples. Let's use some life experiences. Let's talk about those kind of things. I've always said with Francis, if you had a dictionary or perhaps a thesaurus that you could go look up spiritual awakening, they could almost put a picture next to it. You know, like sometimes in dictionaries or thesaurus, different things, they will put photographs to kind of give you examples. Or if you're looking at something, and they give you an, a, an image of the object. Well, why do I say that with Francis? Is because Francis's life journey is, is just a reflection of all of our life's journey, in the sense that when you, when you hear an inner call, when you get con connected with your intuition, with your inner power, your guidance, then simply the next step will be listen and follow. That's the only purpose of inner wisdom and inner guidance, is to guide and direct the mind to unwind from the ego, to unlearn the ego, to release the error. 
and to accept the truth. It's really quite direct and simple. And with Frances, she can share some of her experiences, but there was a, there was a, a great experiential boost of, of love and light from going from encountering her pathway, A Course in Miracles, to teaching the Course intellectually, which a lot of us are familiar with. And some of you are familiar with course groups and study groups. You have a course group right here, right? You have a couple of people, a few people from the course group. Very helpful symbol when you're reading a book that's so deep to have a group of people reading, reading through it, discussing, talking about it and everything. And Francis actually was in Sydney, Australia. We have Roger and Sandy, that's where we met you in, in Australia. Uh, starting off with, anybody here of these meetup groups? They have meetup groups now. Uh, she started a Course in Miracles meetup group in, in a big town, city, Sydney. And I think at one point there was like 100 and, 160, members. 150 Online. members or something. You know, it's quite large. Not that everybody was attending. We know how that goes with course groups, you know. Maybe here and there, a handful here and there. But, and then going from teaching the course conceptually, like teaching the concepts and the ideas of the course, to actually moving into a very powerful experience, like your heart exploding with joy, mm -hmm. with like a huge lightness, like, oh my God, this is spectacular, to, oh, this is my life's calling, and then after it becomes a life's calling, then the spirit, then the spirit shifts into gear, like, okay, now we go. When, when the devotion's there, when you're really ready to listen and follow, then things move quickly. <laughs> Ego attachments start to fall away rapidly. Old patterns that had been looping for many years, or we might say many lifetimes, <laughs> uh, start to just fall away, just drop, as you go into this joy, as the joy takes hold of your heart and you go, beam me up Scotty, let's go, let's go into gear here, then things can go much more rapidly, and, and things that the world might even say are very cherished, uh, start to drop. Some of you saw the movie Titanic, with Kate Winslet, Leonardo DiCaprio. You know what happens with the, the, old, the old lady at the end with the, the jewel of the ocean, this giant diamond that the whole movie was really about. That's a giant diamond of enormous value in the world, is kind of representing the world's values. She goes over to the edge of the boat, oops! <laughs> Out goes the diamond sinking down into the ocean. She's quite pleased to let it go. That's the way your life will go. The things that you seem to pursue and think were so helpful and valuable in this world are like the heart of the ocean. You can, oops, oh, clunk, there it goes, it's gone. And maybe you've spent lifetimes pursuing something and then you're so happy to let it drop off, drop into the ocean, sink back into the deep without, without a concern. She didn't dive in, this old lady, to try to get it. She was quite thrilled to let the, let the huge diamond drop. To me, that's what authentic spirituality is about. You have a change of heart, a change of mind in the valuing. You want to share a little? Yeah. Actually, um, it's Roger and, and Sandy here that really put me, um, you know, in touch with you in a way because I had, I had this group that I had a lot of people um, online that are uh, the group members and um, David came to see me and Sandra and Roger were organizing the event and they want to they want me to put something up on, on the website to inform all my members and I said well I need to check them out first before <laughs> I <laughs> before I advertise or promote anything so I need to go because you know, I heard about David for for a while, till that point, but I always had some kind of resistance. But, you know, I feel quite contained, and it's a self-study course, I don't need a teacher, and so 
because of them, and I said, okay, I have, I have to check this one out, and I went just two hours, two hours gathering, actually, one night, and I was completely blown away, like, experientially. Then one thing led to the next, I signed up for a longer retreat, and everything opened up, this wonderful, amazing connection that I felt in my heart just gave me this courage to actually take one leap, leap out, out of the next. And it's actually quite an experiential pathway from that point on, even till now, I have to say, because before that, I would say, I didn't even know what it actually meant to, you know, to study the course. <coughs> It, it was a very conceptual and it was very intellectual and I loved the ideas even though the book really touched, touched my heart. But that was pretty much it. When I started to let go of seemingly really these um, things that I value and I actually spent my life to build up my career, my relationship and my savings, um, everything that was built up in a way to protect, protect a life or protect a body um, in case, you know, I have to sustain for myself because I, I need to support myself, you know, underneath it all is this one belief that I'm not safe and I need to sustain myself. Including diet, didn't you? Devil in like raw foods and oh, yeah. so it was relationship, your husband, oh, yeah. houses, career, getting your own business, raw and eat, food and diet. Eat, diet, you know, the typical things that are meant to become safety mechanisms for, for the body. Yeah. Eat the drink the better water, eat the better foods and as well as all the other things that take an enormous amount of effort. Yeah, the, at the point it was kind of clear to me the way that I took on this diet probably informed, you know, I don't know, but in, in the purpose, I knew clearly the purpose was not to follow the Holy Spirit. The purpose was to take care of this body. It was so clear to me, you know. So when I look at it, I thought, you know, it's either I go with the Spirit or I go with the body. It's the purpose underneath everything. It's really not the form is right or wrong in any way. So when I saw that so clearly, I couldn't do it anymore. I said I have to drop where the whole thing is coming from. So it was the same for my life, uh, my business, my you know saving, accumulation, my ownership. Everything was dropped quite quickly. And I have to say, there is not a single day passed that I don't feel immense gratitude for what had happened, those steps that I took. There was absolutely no regret, and not no regret, it was just to fill my heart with gratitude that I actually was guided to be able to do that because the benefit that I am experiencing in my mind is valueless. Before I took the steps, the fear was immense. The fear of losing, the fear of even having things and yet not gonna be enough is immense. But that's really where the ego has power over us is, is when we still perceive we're having, you know, something to to protect us in this world. Because I read another article actually, they say, um, it's probably not the best metaphor, but they say the, the, um, the way to threaten someone, because they use this kind of research in uh, probably in the CIA or in those kind of extreme ways, they know is to the, 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 the point when, when you threat someone, is before you actually take the action. Once you take the action, there's no fear anymore. They, you know, you, you threaten them to die and they will be afraid. But once you 
where you threaten to torture someone, they will be afraid. But once you start torturing this, actually no more fear anymore. And I really feel that is the ego. Like it's scare, trying to scare in the mind before you know, before you you think you still can lose something. But once I took those steps, all of a sudden the mind is open up to a complete new experience. Because the fear comes from accumulating and, and possessing. Because the fear comes from a maintaining of an identity that is not true. So everything that we do, everything that I used to do in my life, underneath it is coming from this motive. Protect. Protect something that is not real. That's where the, the fear is really coming from. And once I started to follow the spirit to let go, seemingly inform these steps, but really what's going on is this mind started to open up to allow itself to have an experience of what it feels like to not protect and not defend. In all ways, without exception, you know, it's not just in an argument I choose not to defend myself. It's actually in a lot of other ways in life that I choose not to defend and protect. And the experience that, that comes with it. That is the most convincing thing that we can give ourselves. There's no amount of talks or concepts that can convince the mind what is truly the safety, where the, the peace truly lies, you know. And yet, after I took all these steps that was given, actually was very guided by the spirit, so then, you know, continuously this life is still a very vigilant listen and follow. Every moment is a decision of hear, listening to the spirit and following, listening and following. And it becomes just like the feather, it becomes easier and easier because the mind is more trusting. It's more trusting, it has less motivation to protect and plan and defend anything. It's very, very, you know, it's convinced to allow the spirit to guide in everything. Yeah, I was just really, even every day, because when we travel, all of these little decisions that comes, and we're just so joyful, because we're gliding, it's like gliding through this world with everything. Yeah, I think in the context for this too is that, that everyone who seems to come to this world comes with a, a perceptual identity as being a little born, being a little boy or a little girl, having a family or maybe not, maybe you're adopted or maybe you're like Tarzan, you, you don't have a typical family but you're adopted by the apes. You know, that's Tarzan's self-concept. Not mom and dad but a bunch of apes. Uh, it's still a concept, even to have an ape family is a concept. But at some point, you do realize that it takes a lot of energy to maintain that story and that concept. And people will tell you that about relationships, like don't get in a relationship unless you want to work hard. Well, that's really great. And isn't that enticing? <laughs> don't get into a relationship unless you want to work hard. Or it, work, it takes hard work to maintain relationships, because relationships, they'll say, well, it's, you, you better be willing to compromise in a relationship. All of those things are part of the false identity. Even the compromising is part of the false identity. Jesus tells us in the Course, he says, salvation is no compromise of any kind. So compromise itself is a, is a, a concept that maintains linear time, it maintains the body, it maintains everything about this world. The stars are maintained by that planets, the whole perception of all the galaxies is maintained by this false idea. And then what Francis was talking about, about going in another direction is 
it's pretty early on in the Course in Miracles where there's three lessons of the Holy Spirit. Don't you like that? I like anything that's really simple. You know, if somebody gives me a book and they say, here's the hundred lessons of the Holy Spirit, I'm like, oh God, it's not going to be a lot of work. You either get 95 done and you still, you're not there. Three, uh, that's okay. You mean three steps back to heaven? Yeah, that's all it takes is three steps. So then it's got my attention, you know. First one is I think to have, give all to all. It's a complete reversal of all of our fear mentality, scarcity, uh, protect, you know, hold on to what you've got, uh, have insurance and guard everything you've got. No, to have, give all to all. That's a complete reversal of lack, a complete reversal of, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. It's how, I want to give all to all, and he's really speaking ultimately of, of what's in your heart, what's in mind. It's not saying necessarily it's always going to be that way in form, because there have been those of us in the human condition like Tolstoy, the famous Russian writer, who, who gave away all his possessions to the peasants in Russia. And he, he still felt miserable. He, was, he said, now I'm miserable and poor. <laughs> I was miserable and rich, now I'm miserable and poor. You know, people have tried this out. They've, they've helped us to start to see that we have to really understand what it means, give all to all. Have a loving attitude towards everyone that you meet. Give all of your heart, give all of your love to everyone, to all the animals, to the plants, to the people. Give, give all to all. And that's just the first one, but that's a good lesson. You know, my gosh, if you can, if you can get into that one, then you're, you're a third of the way home. <laughs> And then to have peace, teach peace to learn it, you know, to, we have to become teachers of peace. We teach so many things, as, as parents, you, you may teach things to your children, as teachers you're supposed to teach part of your curriculum in school if you're teaching, teaching mathematics or science or reading or writing, you know, all those things are teaching concepts, but he's saying no, to have peace teach peace, to learn it. Use every opportunity that you have in this world as an opportunity to be peaceful. To be peaceful yourself and to be extending that peace. When the waitress drops your soup on your lap, <laughs> uh, when the cashier gives you the wrong amount of change, when somebody comes in and zooms in front of you to take a parking space that you've got your turn signal on, and they zip right in there, you know. Ah, to have peace, teach peace to learn it. Oh, good. You may see them racing down the car park and you wave them in. <laughs> you see the difference between waving them in and, and waving them yes. <laughs> with another gesture. <laughs> There's a big difference. So it's to have peace, teach peace to learn it. And then, oh gosh, that's all. Now you're two-thirds of the way home. Well, what's the final lesson? What's the final lesson? Be vigilant. You mentioned vigilance. Be vigilant only for God and His Kingdom. Be vigilant for that peace, that happiness and joy. Don't let your mind wander into exceptions where you say, oh, that's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. What? If we're children of God, why should we ever say anything is unacceptable? Why not we, us go into a state of perfect acceptance. Why don't we let everything be equally acceptable, without exception? We'll say, that's pretty radical. You mean like a nuclear holocaust is as acceptable as taking a walk on a sunny day? Yes! Why not, if we're created by a perfect being, why can't we make everything equally acceptable? Because it's only through the ego or the body's lens, so to speak, the, the five senses, that we get into fear. You know, that's the part that, that we lose our essence, we lose our awareness of ourself. We have to, in that lesson, be vigilant only for God and His Kingdom. He actually tells us what's the point. What are we going for with vigilance? And He's saying, well, you're just going for a final realization 
and I'll tell you what the realization is, so he, he lets us know what it is. What you have is what you are. That's the whole point. What you have is what you are. That's the whole point of, of this whole experience on earth, is to just come to one experience. What you have is what you are. Not what you have is what you possess, but what you have is what you are. That having and being are synonymous. Having means the same thing as being. That's the complete reversal of everything that this world was meant to teach. I have a wife. No. What you have is what you are. I have a husband. No. I have a bank account. I have a house. No. I have a car. No. I have a foot. A shoe. A sandal. No. No. I have a leg. No. Anything that you think you have in this world, in terms of an object, is a block to the awareness of the simple idea that what I have is what I am. Some of you remember the cartoon Popeye. I am what I am and that's all that I am. <laughs> These are great wisdom. <laughs> in this. And what's the step? You know, you first have to open up to the idea that you're dreaming a world. You know, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Oh my gosh, we should have paid attention when we were children, because it was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, coming to tell us, here's the way, don't take anything too seriously, row your boat merrily, because it's a dream, and because you are destined to wake up from the dream. And more than that, you're destined to have a happy dream before you wake up. Well that sounds very enticing. It sounds like something that's very practical. Learn not to judge, learn to trust. Let, make your decisions with your intuition, with the spirit. Have a happy dream. Make sure it's really totally happy. And then you can wake up from it. There's no need for a dream when you have a happy dream. Nightmares have gone. Dark dreams have gone. When the dreams become happy, then you know that you're just to the point of, of getting your final lesson, that what I have is what I am. And that's why Buddha taught, empty your mind of everything you think and everything you think you are. He was saying, let go of the false identifications that relate to this world and come into a still, tranquil mind which is beyond this world. That's what Jesus is teaching as well. He's, they're really teaching the same thing, whereas Buddha might call it the void. Go into the void. Jesus is saying, yes, go into the void and come through the void <laughs> to the kingdom of heaven, to full joy, to full happiness, to the fullness of spirit. That's what this journey is really about. It's more of a recognition too. It's not like a real journey. So, in Francis' life, if we use that as a parable again, there was a, there was a real strong sense of joy, a real strong sense of fulfillment that, that just asked you to let go, to surrender the things that had been made to be the self-concept. So that included a husband, a career, a house or two. My country. Country. Diet. Diet. <laughs> yeah. We could go on. Some of you might have an exercise routine or you, whatever. You know, it, you can see anything that's there that's part of maintaining a bodily identity is what the spirit has to rinse away. Because that attachment, that affiliation is going to be a block to spiritual recognition, to a spiritual remembering. Like the memory is still there, the memory of love is still in the mind, but it's just covered over by a lot of false concepts and pursuits. So, in that sense, 
this is a very straightforward pathway. In fact, Francis was saying, it's, you said it's really an, been an experiential pathway. We need experiences to show us that we're on the right track. You know, if we took steps and we didn't feel any lightness, lightheartedness or burst of joy and happiness, then we might even have more suspicion. Okay, I took that step. <laughs> And, you know, we need, it's like you said, it's been an experiential journey, and that's kind of, you could say that's the way it went for me too. I needed experiences to replace the past condition. I needed some bright experiences that would lead me on. It would say, good, 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 very good, now come, take another step. Keep coming, keep coming. The other day I was just thinking that, I mean, you know, because I was traveling with David and, and maybe on the air, airplane where we're meditating and I was just turning to, to you and I thought, I'm so glad that you're an example that it's just not a play of concepts with this path and you're actually embodiment of love and you know love because they just feel, I don't know, it feels like that's what I... I see on a daily basis is this radiating love after we undo the ego. You know, that is a walking demonstration of what this path is about. It's really not about being right and being very sophisticated about metaphysics and a grasp of what the reality is about in words or in concept. It's this embodiment of love, a walking love, <laughs> a <wreck. Walk. laughs> because that is, you know, in the end, it is what this is going to lead to, it's inevitable, you know, it's inevitable when we keep following the Holy Spirit and keep allowing our mind to be surrendered in our everyday decisions, not in the future, actually, it's in the now. This becomes an inevitable experience. It's so joyful and it's so happy. You know, we can say, what is everything for? It's to fall in love. And that is, becomes a daily experience. You keep falling in love again and again. Then there is no falling in. No falling in anymore. If you just be in that, you know, carry it and read it with you, that is the, the kind of the, the goal that the Spirit wants to give us in experience. And yet on the pathway, you know, I do remember, you know, most of the time, especially at the beginning years, when I started to really open up to let go of this heavy defense mechanism that I don't, I didn't even think there were defense mechanisms, they were just my life. They were normal life, you know. There were jobs I had to earn money to maintain a body. But when I started to let go, it feels like there was nothing to hold, in, to hold on to. And then I was guided to actually practice even more openness to open my mind up to share everything in my mind, share not just seemingly possessions, but sharing my, my thoughts, sharing my feelings openly without hiding, protecting, compartmentalizing, sharing one thing with one person, other thing with other person. It's like complete transparency. And that feels like, I don't know, and you know, gradually, it just like feel like that the spirit is always, okay, I think you're ready for this. I'm like, the floor just open up again, once again, and consistently, that's the kind of experience for quite a while. The floor under me just opened up, you know, and yet more and more it becomes something that I actually started to, to feel okay with and enjoy because I know somehow it's, my mind is expanding in something that is so vast and all the boundaries were letting go were, were let go of basically. That was how it felt. But 
it's not just about you know contractions or emotions. In the end, all these emotions will pass as well when we give keep giving them permission to come to come to be released. All the emotions will pass. Then it's just love that that is that stays. You know, it is just so beautiful, so convincing. Yeah, the example of this coming to mind is that Christina's come from Slovakia, and she had sent me an email, and she said in the email, I've been watching your YouTube videos, and uh, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing anybody down in Slovakia that's working with the Course in Miracles. Am I the only Course in Miracles student in all of Slovakia? <laughs> And I had to laugh when I got the email because I thought, it reminded me, you probably heard it on one of my talks, that that's what happened to me when I was over in the United States one time and I got, uh, 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 it was a man from, from Belgium emailed me and he, in the email he said, I am the only Course in Miracles student in Belgium. And then the next day I got an email from a woman who said, I am the only uh, course student in Belgium. You see how the Holy Spirit works, like sends me two emails <laughs> from a man and a woman. So I wrote to both of them and I said, I think you two should meet, because you both think you're the only, the only one. And you're in the same town, Brussels. So, so uh, I think the man brought uh, his girlfriend along, so there they had a, had a cup of tea, the three of them. and. Uh, so I waited about a week later, I thought, I'll, I'll hear back from them. They wrote back to me, they said, hmm, okay, well we've met. Now we know that there's more than just one Course in Miracles student in Belgium. And they said, so we have agreed that there's only one question that we want to ask you. Uh, will you come to us, or must we come to you? That was. <laughs> The next step, will you come to us? So I said, well, I'll pray on that. And then I said, I'll come. I'll come to Belgium. So they're very good. So then they said, is there any instructions that you have? And I said, well, why don't you just be open to finding course groups <laughs> in Belgium? Because I'm sure there are course groups in Belgium. I don't know about Slovakia or not, but I felt. So they started going out and finding, oh my gosh, there's, there's many. Course in Miracles students in Belgium. And they went out and they started meeting them and finding them in course groups and da da da. They started to get very excited. They said, let's do, David's coming, let's do a gathering. And so there was a woman, an American woman, who was married to a Belgium man who had a farm. So they said, okay, this woman Mandy is an American, but we'll use her and her husband's farm. They have children and farm animals. Let's, let's meet on the farm. But well, by the time I actually got to Belgium, there was a whole farm full of people. People came from seven countries, seven different countries. So it started off with a one email, two email, I am the only course student in Belgium, and it turned into a seven country conference. We were out there among the pigs and hay, and we were in the barn. We had a ball, we had a blast, and I met people there, and I, I went back to Belgium many times, but it started off, and I'd say if we went around, I don't know how many countries we have, Slovakia, Czech Republic, I met both of you in Australia, I met you in Australia, Sweden, Sweden, we went around the room, we've got quite a few different representations here as well, here in England, just in this gathering, and, and, it, for, for Christina, for Chris, it was a journey to come to England, to, to leave her country and go, <laughs> leave the comfort zone of your country, which of course is, is part of that self-concept, and then to go off to England, and then you, you posted her, she stayed with you when she came, and so that was part of it. Oh, I found somebody on the Couchsurfing. <laughs> Couchsurfing.com. There we go. We'll get a plug in for that too. <laughs> you see, the Spirit, 
is going to take us out of our seeming comfort zone, which is the familiarity of the past, our past associations that have, we've had for many years that tell us who we are, where we are, what we are, and it's going to take us on a journey, which is what Francis has been saying too, from what seemed to be your life into an experience that we can't even, we don't even know what the form will be. That's part of the trust. We don't know the form our life will take. The ego doesn't like that. The ego likes to have everything planned and laid out. I'm, I've got these goals, it'll turn out this way. You know, it's too scary for the ego to not have a form. But actually that's, that's the way it all moves. It's direction. Yeah. And Christina actually wrote to David after listening to I guess a talk about Belgium. So she wrote to say, I think I'm the only one in Slovakia. I hope you can tell me if there are more. And David wrote back, yes, you're the only one in Slovakia. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope um, if there are more, they probably can hear us now. Yeah, that's what the Spirit said that time, and here she is now. I said, no, you're the only one that I know. <laughs> you're the only one that I know. Slovakia. And then it goes on and on. And then also, uh, uh, you requested a book, because I think you watched some of my videos, but you watched a video uh, with Kirsten. Maybe Kirsten and I, we did one, uh, or one of them, where we did one together, but Kirsten wrote a book, I Married a Mystic, which was about her early travels and years with me, and so, uh, yeah, I hope we'll, we'll get that to you, and I think we got your address in Slovakia, we're working on that one, but, but, it's those kind of, that's where it starts, you know, it starts with a, with a connection, it starts with a spark, it can start with a question. Even one question, like, I'm the only, I think I'm the only uh, course student in Belgium, led to a, a seven country conference on a farm. But all it takes is that little reaching out. Maybe it's a little bit of a curiosity, maybe it's just a little, hmm, I wonder, a little wonder question. That's, that's part of how we got here too. Wasn't there a phone call to you and, or some kind of connection where you, or something you saw? Where you sent an email. I said, oh, I'm traveling, spontaneous. And you travel. said, the word spontaneous just jumped at me. So I spontaneously said, yes, come to England. And then I immediately thought, well, what if he does come? <laughs> <laughs> how will I handle that? Yeah, I will, I will like, put him up. Where will it happen? Do I know people? Do you know all these, you know, the, the ego just whooshed in. Um, but look, here we are. Spontaneity works. Yeah. 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 So that's where this came out, from that spontaneous invitation and then that word spontaneity. Yeah. We were talking last night at dinner, there's another word, simultaneity. Simultaneity. Oh, we were saying, she was saying simultaneity. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I love the sound of that word. Because it's really, that's what forgiveness is. It's taking us into the moment. It's, it's hard for our conditioned mind to think that all of time and space is really happening in one moment. But some of you have read even like Seth material, Jane Roberts, they talked about simultaneity in there. You know, there's a lot of great scribed and channeled materials that have come through that are kind of reminding us that all, that sometimes they talk about parallel lifetimes, it's all it's all parallel. It's so parallel that it's all happening at the same time. That will take a bit of training and forgiveness to come into an experience that it's all in one instant. It's not spread out over millions and millions of years. That's what the convincing job, the Spirit's convincing us. We had it all wrong. This time idea was all mistaken. It's all of one. But I, I mean, there's a lot of parallel ideas, like uh, I remember growing up and they said, uh, how many angels can you fit onto the head of a pin? Those are the kind of questions I would go, hmm, that's interesting. How many events can you fit into one second? What about all of them? That's pretty strong. Maybe we can open it up and see yeah. whether there are any questions and comments. Yeah, we've got a microphone, a roving microphone here. We can share one up here if you like that. I guess my question is really two parts. One is, I 
obviously to your story, but it's receiving that guidance that was key to your transformation. For some of us, that guidance isn't that clear. And so what do you do? You have all these course of miracle ideas, you know you're in the dream, you know you're hanging on to property, money, husband, whatever, but you're still not tuned into receiving the guidance. And so how do you move forward? So that's, that's my first question. And my second question is when you are in a situation, I shared this with you yesterday, Francis, like, What's occurring now to me in my life is a lot of people owe me a lot of money. So I'm trying to sort of fathom what is that a symbol of and also how do I deal with it and how do I move forward? What is the teaching that I'm supposed to receive? And because I'm not tuned into guidance as clearly as Francis is, I'm in a lot of confusion. And I know where my ego wants to go. Uh, and it would be very easy to, to do it. But I don't want to do that. But I don't know what else to do. You know, letting it all go, is that an answer? So that's it, it's two things. It's when you haven't developed that muscle of receiving guidance so clearly, how do you, how are you, how, what being do you take on in this world? When you face a situation, what are the good questions? I ask one question, what is the learning that I'm supposed to learn here? And I'm not here very clearly yet. Okay. Do you want to address that? Do you want me to address it? Maybe I can start? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think for me, um, practice learning lesson, uh, guidance, the you know, the course, Jesus says in the course that there are many answers you have received but haven't heard. So, we actually have received all the guidance, but we, you know, there is a fear of actually hearing it and following it. There is a tremendous fear of following it. Because by following it, not the, not the means that we're afraid, we actually the ego is afraid of where it's leading to. So it, it protests and it put up a lot of resistance and thoughts to say, you know, don't go there. And rational thoughts and logic thoughts. So just knowing that there is a fear of hearing and following the guidance. And in my experience, the clarity increases as I increase my willingness to follow. You know, at the beginning, the, the, the fear is high and the resistance is strong. Then it's seemingly I'm confused about the guidance of is this or that. But as I, you know, give myself the permission, but more wanting to be dedicated to the guidance more and more, what happens is the more I follow, the, the clearer I hear. That's what happens. So I think, you know, it's just, there is no need to judge that there is a tremendous fear to hear the guidance. It's just how it is. And it's a good question in those situations to say, you know, if just I, I, I open my mind up to guidance, you know, let me hear the guidance. And you will know whether you have preference in that moment. You, you know, I, okay, I want to hear guidance, but I'm terrified of letting go of a relationship, for example, or a job. I'm terrified. I know that, there, I don't know whether it's a guidance, but I'm not terrified of one direction. Then it's good to actually to say, I really want to hear guidance, and I'm terrified of this direction. So please, you know, give me some steps to work towards, to just be very honest with your feelings instead of using the, the overall statement of, I don't hear clearly, you know, give me more signs. 
I should say, this is what I'm afraid of. This is the direction I'm afraid of. And fear is always, you know, stop us from receiving it, the clarity. So if it is truly the, the direction, then give me some practical steps that I can work toward that make you in a very open space, a space that you don't hide and push away and pretend or shut down to the Holy Spirit. So just allow you to be very, very open. Yeah, and specifically with what you're saying where it seems to be a situation where a lot of people owe you money, or a lot of people owe you money and are not, will put and are not paying it. <laughs> it's fine if they're, if they're going to pay it the next five minutes, then it's not a problem. But if it's open, like there's not movement, I'm not receiving the money that I'm owed, then there can be a pressure that builds up. Like there's a debt that's not being fulfilled. And, you know, there can be a thought of, well, this is an integrity, you know, people should keep their word and that's the way things should go. People should follow through. If they owe something and they say something, then they should follow through. So, the very idea of debt itself, which is underneath it, you know, is like, we can start to say, if everything is mine, and everything is a reflection of mine, and as Jesus says in the Course, uh, and everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked, without exception. So, he's basically saying, now this is a world of perception, it's a world of ideas, and you're always getting a motion picture back of, of the belief system. Down to the finest details even, there's not any exceptions. That, uh, like Lesson 152, the power of decision is my own. He basically says everything, not only that happens to you personally, but everything that's happened in all of time and space and all of history is there because you elected that it be there. Hitler? Nazi Germany? Yes. Everything, everything throughout all of history is there by an, a belief, it's there by a decision, by an election. There are no exceptions, he says, you may believe that this is too all-encompassing to be the truth, but let me assure you that the truth has no exceptions. So it's coming again from this glorious state of perfect love, there is no exceptions to it. So. What I was talking about earlier with those three lessons of the Holy Spirit, to have, give all to all, to have peace, teach peace, to learn it, and to be vigilant only for God in His Kingdom. Those are the steps that once you initiate, once you kind of give yourself over to them and say, hey, I'm going to need a lot of help <clears throat> to reverse the beliefs in my mind and to come into an experience of that much trust. I think all three of those uh, take a lot of trust. Every one of them takes a huge amount of trust to kind of move in that direction. Let's be honest, it's going to take a lot of trust. And for me, maybe I was ready to hear. I would say there's, there, I was definitely ready and willing. But even ready and willing, at the beginning I, I read the Course for eight hours a day. and used it more like an oracle to kind of immerse myself in the thought system of it quite deeply. But even then, after I started to have this inner stream of thoughts that was Jesus and I thought, thank you, my God, this is, oh, this is so helpful. That was just the beginning. It wasn't that when I finally could hear Jesus that I went, hallelujah, my, my worries are over. Uh, that was the beginning. It's like Jesus had a lot to tell me. <laughs> that was just, to be able to open to hear is a wonderful thing, but then that's just the beginning. There's, there's so much mind training that's required, there's so much unlearning. Even the book, the title of A Course in Miracles is called A Course in Miracles. It's not called A Course in Revelation. It's not even called A Course in Ascension. It's A Course in Miracles. Why miracles? Well, miracles are very convincing, and we need lots of them. <laughs> Not a course in miracles. <laughs> Not even called a course of love. It's a course in miracles. 
many oodles and oodles, kajillions of miracles. Why? Because the fear is so strong. The fear of letting go of the world, the fear of God's love, the fear is enormous. We need to be convinced, and what a better way than to have floods of miracles, like consistent miracles. I would say that the goal of A Course in Miracles is to have your mind become habitually miracle-minded. Uh, have it habitually miracle-minded. Meaning as you flow through the day, you, you have lots of miracles throughout the day. Miracles in the morning, miracles for lunchtime, afternoon miracles, late afternoon miracles, miracles for supper time, evening miracles, and miracles when I sleep at night and dream. Just pop them in there everywhere. Miracles even in the nighttime dreams, as well as the daytime dreams. That's the convincing that it takes. So it gets us away from kind of magic wand thinking like, okay, I click my heels together, my ruby slippers, I get my ruby slippers on, three clicks, there's no place like home, no place like home, no place like home. I'm ready. You know, or we think, where's the pixie dust? Like with Peter Pan, or where's the, you know, where's the, the stardust, the sprinkling things? We need, we need to be convinced. And so for me, once I started to devote to the Course, and then I started to have Jesus talking to me kind of conversationally, which was very, very helpful. Then the next thing was, okay, now let's get busy. We've got a lot of miracles to join and to extend. We have to extend a lot of miracles, and the more you extend them, the more you'll experience them habitually, consistently. Just like anything in this world, if we learn how to ice skate, if we, if we don't ice skate for 25 years, it, we may not really, we have to be a little rusty there. But if we're skating for 25 years, we'll look like Olympic skaters, <laughs> perhaps, you know, if we practice it that much. They practice quite a few hours a day before they get into the Olympic ice skating and ice dancing arena with all the cameras on. And they've put a lot of hours, and they've had a lot of repetition with those skating moves, so they make it look so graceful and easy. But there's a lot that went into that. A lot of times people see me and they, they go, well you just look like you've naturally been happy and go lucky and joyful your whole life. No, I, I was very shy, I was very afraid, I was very isolated. I was voted most quiet in my senior class in the yearbook, and it goes on and on and on. Moses, they say, well Moses, God chose Moses to deliver the Ten Commandments. Moses actually had a stuttering problem. God picked a guy with a stuttering problem to deliver the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That you got to love it. I just love those stories where the ones that are chosen, uh, you think, are you sure? Are you sure <laughs> you know what you're doing? Said the shy, the shy guy to God, you want me to speak on these ideas around the world? Luckily he didn't say that at the beginning. He would have lost, lost me right away. Go oh, get out of here. But, you know, the more you even know about A Course in Miracles, all when you meet the publisher and you meet the characters, you know, people would say, if Jesus Christ is going to send a book into the world to wake people up, uh, who's on his team? It's interesting to me that as I got to, to know about the, the characters who were the scribe and the, the comforter, the teacher of the Course, the publisher of the Course, and, and the early group of the ones that came together, that he didn't pick Christians. He didn't pick Christians. <laughs> he picked Jews. He, he was very traditional, like back in the old day. He had a team of Jews to come in there. And then he, to fund it, he, you know, most people think, well, okay, get the Jews to fund it. No, he picked a transgender man from Mexico to fund his book. Totally, you know. He's, he's off the charts with everything. He's, he's going to bring this book into fruition using his hand-picked uh, characters. What a team! A transgender man from 
There was all this stuff of the gays and all this. And this was back in the 60s. In the 60s, he was doing this. He picked his team, handpicked his team to deliver what would work. And, and I think that he's doing that with us right now. He's, he's saying, if you'll hang with me, trust me that I, have, I make no mistakes in who I'm choosing. It's really not, he's not choosing like the chosen people. These aren't the chosen ones. Everyone is called. Few choose to listen. But he knows which ones will listen. And he knows which ones which will answer. And those are the ones that are, that are part of the first generation, you might say, of, of, of carrying forth this work in this form, or the ones that are like willing. You are willing to host us here, and then the ego came, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you getting yourself into? That's the way all of us feel. That's the way I felt at the beginning. It's like, what am I getting myself <laughs> into here? How big is this? You know, you take one baby step and before you know it, oh my God, your life, the last 30 years have all been the same thing. It's been a, this devotion that took over. And, you know, and to me that's, that's glorious. So, so just to be aware that it's a convincing, convincing job that's going on is important. Can you take yes. I just want to say my experience because I've started to, to do the book and I, and I love it and like I say it's it's home so for the practical side of things which I've had a lot of the practical uh, tests right at this moment in time and over the past few months I have what has helped me personally with sort of dilemmas with money and things like that, is that we're all in a program. We have all lost touch with love. So therefore, to have expectations of the people outside that owe you money, or your parents, or your family, or your friends, they're lost as well. And for what I've realized is, for me to be able to love them is to let go of the fact that I expect them to behave decently when they can't, in, in a way, because they're still in a pattern of not seeing the bigger picture. Does, does that make sense? So I'm not saying I'm better or of course it, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that to help me through the um, problem, problematic or the tests that have taken place is for me to realise that it all boils down to the choices I've made, the experiences I choose to um, take from that, and then how I um, move on with that, and to have other have expectations, you'll always get a disappointment, because when people are in the dark still, as we all are, until we want to willing and want the willingness and, and uh, the wanting to come out of that, um, we, we, to have expectations their behavior is going to be any different is not. It's just not going to happen. So as uh, we had a course evening last night and, um, and the teacher sort of said, nothing here works. Nothing here works. And in, in, that, in that sense, once you can get over that, it's then opening up to a lighter uh, experience of love and showing light on things. Well, in Take Me to Truth by Luke Sanchez and Thomas Vera, they say there's a bit that says, are you sick and tired of being a person who's always the bigger person? Mm -hmm. Are you sick and tired of always making allowances? And if you're doing A Course of Miracles, being bigger and more understanding. And she said that it's because you might, you're probably the same now. And I like that. I really you're more like aware. That yeah, you say, you know, you, you're, you're not necessarily sane, but you're the saner of the situation. Yeah, you move from the ward in the sanity complete. And then next time it might be someone else who's saner than you and they take the slack. And I really yeah. like that. It sort of took the weight off yeah. me. It's like a stepping stone idea. And Jesus says that too in the Course. Whoever is the saner of the two, mm. remember your indebtedness, your gratitude to your brother. And that helps you in that moment, you know, 
whoever is the saner of the two. And I think it does come back to our trust thing because and our fears yeah, as well. Yeah, and, it's and our fears facing our fears yeah. and because this money thing, you know, is is really a big thing. As Francis says, you've got so many things in your life that you build up, program, society is saying how you're meant to be, what you're meant to have, etc. etc. So when it comes to money, um, it's it's a it's a big it, it become it can become an incredibly big heavy burden and charged with fear. And um, you know, I had that yesterday, a simple thing. Um, where I wanted to, I have no overdraft, I have one bank account, and I wanted to go in there and, and um, say, could I just have a cushion of £100? And um, uh, it's, a, it's a long story behind this, but anyway, the answer was no. And because I'd gone one day overdrawn by £5.50, so it wiped out my three years of good behaviour, in inverted commas. And, and I, I, I stood there and the fear that came up about money, security, banks, how I hate well, the system and all this kind of, was wonderfully incredible <laughs> because I went and sat in the shop opposite to have a cup of coffee looking at this Halifax, <laughs> sitting there thinking, I'm exceptionally angry, I'm annoyed, and I had to, Muna, I had to go through what this was for what it was doing to me, why, and where it was coming from. And I recognised it as being a fear. It wasn't her fault, it wasn't that fault. This is, it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. And it was all what I was doing. And it was, it was really quite something. So it was really nice. A, a weird experience, but, you know, very nice. Yeah. And it's, it's practical, because I would do that too when, when fear would come up. Sometimes you're... You associate it with something, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. On the spiritual journey, there'll be times where you'll just start to feel fearful and you'll look around and you'll think, I have no reason at all to be fearful right now. There's nothing threatening me, but I feel fearful. So it's coming from inside, it's coming from, we will call it subconscious, from the shadow that's pushed out of awareness. And, and the whole point is to raise the shadow into awareness. And, so there's many pathways. There's the pathway of introspection. You know, the, those that are very introspective are, are looking, what are, what are the roots of the fear? You know, I would say if you take it all the way down, it comes back to this belief in separation from God and belief in linear time is at the bottom of it all, like an inverted pyramid. But it's so stacked with all these other things, where, like you mentioned in the movie Inception, we have so many seeming levels of dreaming that you forget that you're dreaming. You start to take it all as real. That's what happens when we go to a movie theater. We don't sit in the movie theater and put down 10 pounds just to say, movie, 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 through the whole thing. No, we're, we're, we're wanting to be engaged. We want to be lost. We want to be taken in. That's why we pay the 10 pounds. We want to be taken in, swept away, taken off to a whole... Distracted. Distracted. You know, and, but, but to actually be attentive, very, very attentive, I think, is, is also part of this. Because these are very, very deeply rooted beliefs. Money itself, Jesus tells us, is nothing, but, but money is such a symbol, it's such a, an exchangeable symbol for so many other things in the world, that it takes on exaggerated proportions. Yes. Can I follow up? Yes. Yeah, thank you for all that. I think I think my guidance was clear. But what kicks in is the spiritual ego. We talked about it as well. And a spiritual ego doesn't go to court and fight battles because that's believing in this world. But I think the, guide, could, the guidance could, for me was to actually get on it. The, the guidance for me was to actually fight this out. And I do remember, and that frightens me. So the learning is to face my fear and deal with it. But then I get stuck with the spiritual ego that a spiritual person doesn't do that. And I do use evidence from your videos that um, you think, yeah, you think enlightenment is not congruent with people going to court. And you mentioned Kenny Portman doing that, and you put a question mark around it. In, in my
my def the defenselessness, my safety lies. Taking that to the full extent without any exceptions. So that's not a spiritual ego. And the ego is, is into defense and attack, accusations, defenses and so forth. And that's, so, <coughs> Jesus will never guide the mind to defend or attack in, in any circumstance. In other words, he wouldn't put a lesson in there, uh, in the Bible, blessed are the meek, you know, for they shall inherit the earth. He would never have said, if someone smite you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. That's, those are amazing teachings. You won't find that in the history of the world, you'll never find a teaching like that. You can go back through all the teachings through history. If someone smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Now that's defenselessness. If someone had, you know, asked for your, your coat off your back, get in your cloak as well. Get in the coat and the cloak as well. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting beyond intellectual things and spiritual ego stuff and talks like that because that, the ego can hide behind even those phraseologies. It's actually a convincing job to like at one time Wayne Dyer was, was going through a, a very long protracted uh, lawsuit and uh, I remember he wrote that in, about that in one of his books and he was, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse till he was finally talking to a good friend of his and Wayne was explaining everything and how many months it had gone on and maybe even years and, and his friend was saying uh, these people that you're in this lawsuit, I think you should buy them a bouquet of flowers. And Wayne was like, what are you talking about? But that's actually what brought the whole situation to an end. In 12 Steps they talk about making amends to those that you believe that you've harmed. I have found it's the miracle reverses all the laws of time and space. And so when, when there's a situation where you even think you're being unjustly, unfairly treated or uh, unjustly accused or any of those things, that's, that is the call for love. And the miracle comes from an, a higher place, a transcendent place. So, that, I think that's the most important thing. And, and the other thing about it is it's very practical. Like in this world, as we grow up and we go through, I mean I went through grade school, high school and 10 years of university. I studied economics, supply and, and demand. I, I studied everything of, of this world. And then when I started really tuning in with Jesus, he's like now, None of that that you've learned will help you at all. It's like that's, that's been the block. Now we will get into a pathway of true generosity. Well, I'll teach you what it means to have, give all to all. I will have to, I will have to work through you to be that generous. You know, it's going to only come from spirit. But, but that was also part of the convincing because, you know, he started working with me when I had student loans and debts. I had to practically listen to his guidance to unwind from those, not try to come up with ways, but to actually follow that step by step for as long as it would take. And actually with traveling and doing, you know, you come in financial things, you get those all along the way. Not only financial things, but where do I sleep? How do I eat? You know, those are real basic practical things. But that's what convinced me of the miracles. That's what allowed the miracles through. And, and to me it has to be exceptionally practical. But, but it will never come from going against a brother or a sister. Never. There will never, ever, ever be a solution. Even some of these things from Arjuna and go out on the battlefield and be the best warrior you can be. No. Not from Jesus Christ. Uh, it will never come from going against. I remember one time do you, do you somebody. Have to, sorry, do you have to be against? Because you mentioned that you're 
mentioned integrity. Integrity is important. Do you actually have to be against someone to call them to account? Well, recently I was reading up on Albert Einstein and, and everybody knows about Albert Einstein and they've said he's one of those brilliant and genius minds in the human, in human history. Who was Einstein inspired by? That's kind of a question I always thought, well, who, who inspires Einstein? Gandhi. Gandhi, Einstein's quotes on Gandhi, he said, scarcely will people, and for, for generations to come, scarcely will, will there be people that believe that such a man walked on earth as Gandhi. Now, of course, if you go to Gandhi and you read his autobiography, he hated being called Mahatma, great soul, because he had so many issues going on. So he didn't even like the word Mahatma. But if you go back to Jesus now, we're talking, <laughs> now we're talking transcendence, you know. Gandhi always said, please don't, I'm experimenting with the truth here. <laughs> go to some of the sages, you know. But Gandhi inspired <coughs> Einstein to be a pacifist, but then Einstein lived at the time of Hitler. And so his pacifism was, of course Gandhi lived at the same time, but Gandhi wouldn't budge. He was a pure pacifist. <laughs> He would not budge from the idea of nonviolence. He was going to be nonviolent the rest of his life. He was not going to give in to any exceptions. They tried. I, I mean, Gandhi got interviewed. What about Hitler? He said, "Well, there may be many things that come, you know." But he was still going to stick with it. Einstein went a little bit from pacifism, meaning that I think, practically speaking, we may have to use some force. The stop Hitler, E equals MC squared, and it ends up being a nuclear, nuclear bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki and so on and so forth. But, what Jesus is teaching is the most pure form of pacifism. He's basically saying, if I defend myself, I'm attacked. And that was a further teaching on if someone smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. So, one time they asked, Mother Teresa, if she would come to attend and support an anti-war rally, and her answer was, no, <laughs> she would not come to an anti-war rally. She would come to a pro-peace rally. Isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful quote from, from Mother Teresa, again coming it around to, where is the motive? What is the motive behind it? She said, if you have a pro-peace rally, I will come. I can join you in that motive. But I can't come to an anti-war rally because what business does the Son of God have being anti-anything? Anti-trust is a word. <laughs> Why would we want to get into anti-trust in any way? So, basically, what we're talking about is not just lawyers and legal systems and courts, but Frances was starting to share that her identification with a husband, her identification with a career or a job, her identification with a diet, her identification with, you know, you could go anything that we feel that we're identified, that it's part of our self-concept, is a defense mechanism against the truth. Now that's starting to get more subtle. I even watched a recent uh, beautiful movie, uh, what was it called, the Dalai Lama Awakening? Mm, something Awakening. Something, great, great Awakening, or something Awakening. And Dalai Lama was teaching, and they had Fred Allen Wolf and quantum physicists and thinkers, progressive thinkers in there. It got down to a point where they were looking at this whole idea of Tibet, with Buddhism and Dalai Lama having to flee Tibet, and so it wasn't so much that people owed him money, it was like his country <laughs> was taken. He was chased out of seemingly his country, and I always see that ultimately as a blessing. My gosh, I'm so glad that he got chased out of there, and now he's chased, he goes all over the world <laughs> sharing this joy and this kindness. <laughs> Thank God they got him out of the, out of the mountains. <laughs> you know, I, I see the blessing of the whole thing. People 
say, no, the, Ch the Chinese, you know, they're going to have to pay. There's got to be some payback. You don't chase somebody out of their home without some payback. I think it was part of the divine plan and I'm actually grateful that, that it happened. But that's a higher perspective and what was happening there was they were still going through these issues around Tibet. One lady was like, oh my shoes were made in China so I'm taking off my shoes. I'm not going to wear Chinese shoes to protest this event that happened decades ago and so forth. Actually, one woman stood up and basically said, we need to look at the Tibets in our own mind, which was taking it off the, the world of externals, seeming externals back into what are the thoughts and beliefs that I have about Tibet. There was the great prophet and sage from Liverpool, England, John Lennon, who said, imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can. There was a prophet. Right there, if, if you could practice that one line from John Lennon, you would never have an issue with Tibet. Nobody. Buddhists would never have an issue with Tibet if they would practice one line from the great sage from Liverpool. <laughs> People don't think of it. Did say that the path of peace was the hardest path? I think... Because I haven't read the book, books about him, <clears throat> but I'm sure that I read something where he was... Someone was asking him, saying, Gandhi, how do you do this path? And he, he was explaining, but he said to them, it is really hard, it's not easy. It's, the path of nonviolence is the hardest path. Yeah, I think I could see where he would come from that, because basically the path of, of nonviolence, the path of non-judgment, the path of non-attack, is going to bring up everything in the unconscious mind that, that is for attack and violence and judgment. So the whole ego belief system which has been pushed, it's mostly unconscious, has got to all come up. So, and certainly the ego is going to react. It's, if you are going to go on a path to perfect peace or enlightenment, the ego is like, hell you are. <laughs> that's, what's the undoing of me? <laughs> that's, a, that's not a good path to go. So it's going to try to make through self-sabotage, it will try to make it the most extremely difficult journey or, or pathway as you can. So, yeah, I'm definitely not saying that, uh, that if you take this path that the ego will perceive it as an easy path. Oh, it will fight and kick and scream and protest all the way. But I am advocating for that sense of defenselessness and I think it takes a lot of trust huge amount of trust. Because though I've had those things come up in my life where, where it seemed like there was an accusation coming and then I had to really face that accusation thought and start to see that the, that the role of the accuser was tied into an identity and tied into a story. And I had to let go of that story before that seeming accusation stopped. <clears throat> it was always like an identity attachment. There was always something in there with that. And also it's been a pathway of, of trust. Like, I really trusted when Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. That's another teaching <coughs> from the Bible. And so, it became like as I began recording things and putting things on the internet, it became a ministry of putting things out and making everything freely available. In the later years, people they would put prices on some, but the, those were still freely available. For those that believe they have to pay for something for it to be valuable, there was something else to, for them as well. But for those that were willing to just op be open and find it, it's all freely, freely available. To me, that's just a symbol of how our life is to go. Can we come to that level of trust where we are into the giving and the, the extending? And can we come into a, a state of mind where we see that, that nothing ever can be really taken from us or asked of us that we don't already have? It's that having and being are the same. So, 
if I come to an experience that what I have is what I am, then I see that, that nothing can ever be taken away. I have to come into an experience that loss is impossible. I have to come into an experience that attack is impossible. That's the only solution. Not that I have to be courageous in the face of a real attack, but that I have to come into such a conviction, an experience, that attack is impossible. That's the end of sickness. My mind cannot attack. I am not a body and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. That, that's from A Course in Miracles. That's Jesus' logic. I am not a body and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. That's, that's amazing. But I have to fully believe the first two tenets before the last one is true. If I want to reach a state where I cannot be sick, then I have to believe I am not a body and my mind cannot attack. Which means attack thoughts must be impossible. So that just shows the depth of this. But I think that's why we're all here. We would not even be holographically or quantumly assembled in this configuration unless there was something that was saying, I want to know that experience. But it will never come from a motive of, of being against, against somebody. Because that very thought is a violent thought. It's just an error that I need to be against. In fact, I think that's in the Bible. If God is with us, who can be against us? Is what, what it says in the Bible. That's lovely. I think that's, that's lovely. Could you say something more about your experience with the Course? How did it end? You were taken there. Well, I, no, nothing has ever come to court with me because I, I catch it, <laughs> I nip it in the bud before it gets there. If I was talking about being accused or threatened, and uh, what I, when, the, when the accusal came, then I went into prayer and, and I let say to Jesus, okay, how do we handle this one? <laughs> you know, it's like, but an accusal then, so he said, here, I, we'll write a we'll write an email, or write, we'll write a, a letter or something. You see how proactively loving Jesus is. He's not going to let it get to court. Hell no! He'll, he'll intercept that attack thought and throw so much love, because what is an accusal except a call for love? To Jesus, everything is either a love or a call for love. So again, like in Wayne Dyer's case, he sent the flowers and then the lawsuit was gone. In my case, I sent a letter, there was a phone call, it was addressed proactively through extending love and so forth, and then it never came, it was cut off at the pass, so to speak, like an old thing. Don't let it come till the, the, they jump on your stagecoach and, <laughs> and have the guns, you know, cut them off at the pass. Love precedes uh, attack. And, and so that was a very great lesson for me. I was like, oh, thank you. You handle things so much better <laughs> than I could ever imagine to. But that's, that's what it means. I mean, that's, that's what I like. Even this Ho'oponopono, Dr. Hugh Len who does that, you know, how he, he goes through and he cleared out a whole psych ward and he goes through before he does his sessions, he just goes through the names of all the people who are coming before they even get there. I was talking to a group, I think recently in Finland, in Finland, and I said, isn't that wonderful? He's forgiving the participants before he even meets them. That's the way to go. Now that's proactive forgiveness. Forgive them before you even meet them, before anything even seems to happen. And now he's in a state of deep silence, you know, in, in California, you know, he's He's doing it for the whole world. He's going to clear all seven billion out of there. You know, not just list a thing. He's, you know, you see, you got to love that. You got to love that experience of going so proactive that you are clearing the thoughts in your mind. Do you have a break? Hmm? Oh. 
we have one last one and then we'll take a break. Uh, I just wanted to clear something up because I'm not sure if I've heard it correctly. Because I've been studying the course now for about 20 years. <clears throat> and to me, everyone who shows up in my life is another aspect of me. And just because I've been studying the course for 20 years doesn't make me superior and then less awakened. To me, we're, we're all awakened. And they very kindly showed up with an issue that's for my benefit to look at and to heal. So I'm just very aware of sometimes we can get into this holy ego idea of I'm a little because I've got a bigger understanding or I'm more tuned in consciously. I think everyone is. And, and I really thank the people who turn up and create difficulties in my life because it's still an unhealed thought in me that they've been very brave and generous enough to present to me. Yeah, what I would say is there's no one ahead and no one behind because it's all just one mind. Yeah. So, so there's no superior, there's no inferior. Um, Jesus has seven stages of the development of trust and including the, the last one in which it may take a long, long, long time. You put three longs <laughs> before time to say, in terms of mind training, it may take a long time to let go of uh, every, to ask what you truly want in every situation, any, every seeming situation. So it's, it's not so much, there's no one ahead, no one behind. Also though, don't use the word awake and issue in the same sentence. Um, awakeness doesn't have an issue. There are no issues in awakeness. So that's the only thing I would point out. Uh, when we say everyone's awake, then, then there are no issues. If there's still issues showing up, then there's sleep. We could just call it by, by the name, sleep and, and dreaming. And, and that keeps it very much on the focus, like, okay, show me then, if I'm still seeing issues. So, it doesn't matter how long you study the Course, as long as there's issues showing up, then it's a dream of forgetfulness, it's a dream of sleep. As long as there's issues showing up, then there's no acceptance of the Atonement. And the Atonement's the only thing he's asking us, it's our sole responsibility, is just to accept the Atonement for ourselves. And as long as there's a perception of, a, of attack, defense, issues or whatever, then that's, that's just dreaming. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word awake. That. I wouldn't even use the word forgiveness. Forgiveness hasn't, hasn't been fully experienced. What the Course does is the Course is saying there seems to be stages and steps. But ultimately, forgiveness is a state of mind, it's not even a process. So, as long as it's described as a process over time, it's still not it. It's not, not atonement, it's not forgiveness. As, as the mind joins with the Holy Spirit, we see this amazing thing of do not see error. Well, do not see error has to be a very high state of mind. Because that would mean do not, do not see issues. Uh, there would be no issues. So the gratitude can still be there because everyone who shows up that even seems to have an issue is helping. They're saying, oh, what, what you were denying is here. I'll act it out for you to make it plain so you know that you have a need for forgiveness. So, that, so in one sense, there's an enormous gratitude with, with everyone that comes. But I still wouldn't, I wouldn't call that awake. I would just say that's that's us. moving in the right direction. Yeah. Okay, why don't we take maybe a 10, 10 or 15, 15, minute, minute. 15 minute break and come back. Restrooms are in here and there's one over there. <laughs> and tea and coffee. And tea and coffee. Right over there. Can we pause this?